This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Yort. It's Wednesday, April 22nd. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, a Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at our VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate your staying with us on Africa 54. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has spoken with the leaders of the United States, Germany and France as he tries to build support for an international probe into the origins and spread of the deadly coronavirus pandemic, including the response of the World Health Organization. But Australia's push for the independent inquiry is garnering sharp criticism from China, which has issued a statement saying that Australian lawmakers are acting as the spokesperson of U.S. President Donald Trump. Now to Africa, where South African President Cyril Ramaphosa is unveiling a new $26 billion rescue package to help the country recover from the ongoing economic impact of COVID-19. Ramaphosa says the coronavirus outbreak is causing the nation's poorest citizens immense hunger and social distress, and that 250,000 food parcels will be distributed across the country in the coming days. The new funding will also increase financial grants for child support and for unemployed citizens. South Africa has nearly 3,500 confirmed cases of COVID-19, including 58 fatalities. In West Africa, Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari has asked Chief Judge Ibrahim Tanko Muhammad to free prison inmates who have been awaiting trial for six years or more to ease overcrowding as the coronavirus spreads, according to a spokesman. Buhari says inmates with no confirmed criminal cases against them, elderly prisoners and those who were terminally ill could be discharged. Burkina Faso and Ghana are easing some coronavirus lockdown restrictions this week to test the possibility of a return to a semblance of normality after weeks of shutdowns that have harbored both economies. The West African countries have seen rising numbers of COVID-19 cases and it isn't clear yet how bad it will become. In Burkina's capital, Ouagadougou, markets had been closed since March 25th. On Monday, the government reopened one as a test to see if it could safely do the same with the rest by the end of the month. In Ghana, President Nana Akufo-Addo lifted a three-week lockdown in its two main cities where non-essential businesses reopened. Akufo-Addo says his decision was made based on improved tracing of the disease and to protect the economy. More than 1,000 people have tested positive, and as in Burkina Faso, numbers are still rising. Ghana says it could restore the lockdown if necessary, but the president says he is confident about the government's aggressive testing capacity. Leading U.S. doctors' organizations are urging the White House to collect data to show exactly who is dying from COVID-19. Data collected so far shows the coronavirus is killing African Americans at an alarmingly higher rate than it's killing white people. VOA's Kara Pearson has the details. There's an old saying that when white America gets a cold, black America gets pneumonia. That's never been more true than with the coronavirus. There are several states that have released some of these data that are showing that African Americans are having um, higher rates of hospitalization, higher rates of death when they do go to the hospital. In Louisiana, African Americans make up a third of the population and account for 70 percent of the deaths. Similar disparities exist in other states, too. In New York City, Hispanic people make up 29 percent of the population, but account for 34 percent of the city's deaths from COVID-19. That's according to the city's own data. African Americans, Hispanic Americans, and other minorities generally have lower incomes than their white counterparts. Many of them are essential workers, and they often can't afford health care. We know that blacks have more hypertension, more heart failure. We know that both Latinos and African Americans have more uh, asthma and more severe asthma. 
And we know that all race ethnic minority groups uh, have higher rates of diabetes by a significant amount, often double what uh, the white population does. These are the three major common underlying disease risk factors that have been identified. Social distancing prevents disease, but it's impossible for people with low incomes. How can you tell a single mom with three kids to self-isolate if they've had an exposure? Let's say they work as a nurse's aide at a hospital and they, oh, you've been exposed, you have to go self-isolate. Well, you can't self-isolate, you have to take care of children. Or you can't self-isolate in a household where there's three rooms and there's you know, eight people living there. In order to survive this virus, your body has to be healthy enough to fight it. Getting the disease is like getting a punch. And if your body is not in top shape, then that means you're that less likely to be able to tolerate that punch. Uh, so if you have diabetes, which is relatively uh, suppressive for your immune system, when you get infections, you're more likely to have worse outcomes. If you have heart disease coming into it, your heart needs to pick up its rate to deliver more blood and nutrients if you have an infection. If you're not able to do that so well, then you're gonna have worse outcomes. Dr. Tyson Bell says now that political leaders are aware of the situation, data can be collected and policies changed. Dr. Alicia Perez Stable says change will not come fast. He says these health disparities have existed for a long time and activists, politicians, and minorities need to prepare to run a marathon instead of a sprint. Carol Pearson, VOA News, Washington. The White House is ordering a 60-day suspension of immigration into the United States, specifically for individuals seeking permanent residence, also known as a green card. President Donald Trump says the move is necessary to protect American workers already suffering from the coronavirus pandemic. VOA White House correspondent Patsy Widakuswara reports. U.S. President Donald Trump said that his 60-day suspension for individuals seeking permanent residency, also known as a green card, is necessary to protect American workers. It would be wrong and unjust for Americans laid off by the virus to be replaced with new immigrant labor flown in from abroad. The White House has not released details about the plan, but Trump said that there will be exemptions for temporary guest workers, such as those who work seasonally on farms. The farmers will not be affected by this at all. If anything, we're going to make it easier, and we're doing a process that will make it better for those workers to come in to go to the farm. It's unclear whether Trump means suspension of all green card processing or just new applications, and whether application-based family ties, including spouses of American citizens, would be impacted. Much of the actions by U.S. immigration systems have already stopped due to the pandemic, with almost all visa processing indefinitely suspended for weeks. It's not yet known whether this executive order would impact health workers on H-1B visas who are seeking to transfer their status to a green card, but the move is already creating concerns among public health experts. Data from the U.S. Census Bureau shows that immigrants make up a large portion of the healthcare industry, including 28 percent of physicians, 15 percent of nurses, medical assistants, and health technicians. He is going to be halting uh, the immigration of experts who could be helping to tackle this pandemic. Republican lawmaker Matt Gates has been working with Trump to finalize the order. The constellation of ideas that the president is currently refining for that executive order uh, considers the types of folks that would regularly traverse the border for commerce as opposed to those who are actually engaged in the act of immigration to, uh, who, have, you know, who don't live and work in the United States and would come here for that purpose. The president has legal justifications to enact immigration policies for health reasons. The recent Supreme Court decision upholding Trump's travel ban also gives him legal precedent. But analysts point out that with most polls showing the majority of Americans disapproving of Trump's handling of the pandemic, this could be politically motivated. This move allows him to try to change the conversation around pandemic. And I think he's trying to sort of present himself as making a large major decision that can mitigate the public health and economic fallout from, 
from what's been happening with the spread of the virus. Trump, who is running for re-election on his immigration record, has often touted his order to stop the entry of some travelers from China in late January as a decisive move that saved many lives in the pandemic. Hatsuida Kuswara, VOA. Spain, with one of the highest death tolls from coronavirus, enacted strict social distancing measures in mid-March. But with the number of infections and deaths now slowing down, the Prime Minister, Pedro Sanchez, has announced that the kingdom is cautiously moving to relax those measures. In this report, narrated by Jonathan Spear, Alfonso Bito in Barcelona tells us Spaniards are anxiously awaiting a return, even if it's a slow one, to normal life. These early April scenes of deserted city streets throughout Spain show the extent of the rigorous measures to lock down social and economic activity. Measures that have achieved some success, say Spain's leader. Thanks to all that social discipline we have saved, let us never forget, tens of thousands of lives. Now on the streets today, Spaniards are mostly complying with social distancing measures. Employees in non-essential industries have returned to work and people seem more relaxed. Yet there are worries some are losing their fear too quickly. People are coming by, walking their dogs a thousand times over, shopping without limits, every single day. We have had to warn people that they cannot come and shop every day. People are not paying attention and they don't care. Some people are very selfish. While workers, shoppers, people walking their dogs are visible on the streets, there are no children. Children have been on lockdown since March 14. But now the government has set a date when they will be allowed to leave their homes. From April 27, the government, the government will take relief measures if you allow them the expression for the deconfinement of the little ones. It's a long-awaited measure in a country that has confined children the longest. With Spain now taking the first steps of returning to normal, the impact of its actions could determine if there is a rebound in the number of infections and whether restrictive measures need to be reimposed. For Alfonso Beato in Barcelona, John Spear, VOA News. Quarantine and lockdowns in many U.S. states have moved life online, including the search for love and companionship. For now, that will have to be virtual through dating apps. Karina Brafazin investigates dating during a pandemic. While millions of people are quarantined at home, love still finds a way and dating apps are adapting to the new reality. The use of dating apps is up in some cases by 20%. The app Tinder even made the option to search for a date outside your city for free. So now users can look for love anywhere, since the date will have to be an online one anyway. I suggest, hey, do you want to grab a drink on FaceTime? She's like, yeah. So we were going back and forth. And um, yeah, we just decided to jump on it. And her, one of her comments to me was, uh, can, I, can I just wear sweats to this thing? And my exact response was, I haven't worn grown-up pants in three weeks. Why so start now? So yeah, we were both super informal and real comfortable. Dinner and wine are not the only options for a first online date. Dating app users say they go on dates while grocery shopping, cooking dinner and even playing video games. Dating app developers say online dates are not so different from in-person ones. I have to do something different because it's a virtual date. A lot of first date um, or even second date dating etiquette, just uh, the same thing applies. You want to make an effort to look nice because that so shows that you care um, and you're putting effort to actually, you know, make a good impression. You want to, um, you know, first date, I think it's good to keep it light and casual. While it might be useful to make sure the mic and camera work just fine before the date, there definitely won't be room for a painful search for topics of discussion. The pandemic has taken over the thoughts of everyone, regardless of their location. Rarely do you have a moment where people, no matter where, what your geography, have one main thing on the mind, and that is COVID-19. And so uh, there's a real desire to connect. In the new reality that has temporarily put all real dates out of bounds, online dating might have some advantages. This is a good chance for us to dig deeper, take things a little bit slower. And even though people are enjoying this virtual dating now, there is no doubt that once the quarantine is lifted, couples will be back in the real world looking for love.
Karina Befredjan for VOA News, Washington. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, Lagos-based e-commerce tech Jumia joins the fight against coronavirus across Africa. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to Africa 54. As the COVID-19 pandemic has devastated New York, the state has ordered all non-essential businesses to close. Viewers Maria Madiello reports on a taxi driver and a bodega owner who both need to keep working to provide for their families, but they also need to help people feed themselves and move around the city. Before the pandemic swept in, America's loudest city often lived up to its own hype. Then the coronavirus all but shut it down. Nikolai Hent is a taxi driver who continues to cruise along empty streets searching for the few workers who need to keep moving. I used to have like 20 plus customers a day. Now I have five, six, seven. So I used to make, you know, least easy $300 a day plus. Now if I make a hundred times I can be lucky. The 63-year-old has been driving a taxi for over three decades. These days, it takes him more than an hour before he lands his first fare, but he knows where to find it, Mount Sinai Hospital. Hospital workers, they change at between 7 and 8 and, and p.m. So once you finish with those uh, last jobs, one or two, if, if you're lucky, you can get two or one. So then there's no reason to stay on the street because there's nobody around 59th Street. The city's legendary traffic has all but disappeared, with no office workers flagging him down at evening rush and no crowds heading home from ball games or other activities. But he says he has to eat and provide for his family and can't wait for the government because he doesn't know when they'd come for help. Unlike Hent, the Batista brothers didn't know how important their bodega was to the neighborhood until everything started closing. There was a man that called us two days ago, everything is closed. He's like, I don't know what I will do without you. Without you, The man's 85 years old. So we're like, you know what, even if we close down, if I have to go to my house and cook food for you, I'll do it for you. For years, New York's corner stores called bodegas have been a place to shop for everything from dish soap to cheeseburgers. It's been coast town, like a lot of people used to come in you know, the workers from the hardware store, plumbing supplies, all the offices around here, they used to come in for lunchtime and breakfast, and like, you don't get that kind of crowd no more. The brothers say that even though they've seen a 30 to 40 percent drop in business, they've never felt closer to the community. Maria Madiello, VOA News. China's alleged underreporting and misinformation about the coronavirus outbreak that originated in the Chinese city of Wuhan is becoming a heated topic in the U.S. presidential election. VOA's brand pardon reports that both President Donald Trump and his Democratic rival Joe Biden have launched dueling campaign ads accusing each other of being soft on China's handling of the pandemic. President Trump's re-election team recently released an ad revisiting themes from his 2016 campaign, attacking China and accusing his Democratic rival, this time former Vice President Joe Biden, of corruption. If that uh, worked last time, uh, they may be thinking that it has a chance to work uh, again this time. 
Trump won the 2016 presidential election in part by blaming China for the loss of U.S. manufacturing jobs and characterizing then-Democratic nominee Hillary Clinton as corruptly tied to corporate interests. The Trump campaign ad targeting Biden contrasts the president's decision to cut off travel from China to prevent the spread of the coronavirus with his rival's opposition to the travel ban. But the ad also uses out-of-context statements from Biden to portray him as soft on China, and it accuses him of being financially compromised based on unproven allegations that his son Hunter Biden inked a billion-dollar deal with a Chinese state-run business. Before the coronavirus pandemic, Trump had been touting strong economic growth during his presidency as a key campaign issue. Now widespread business closures imposed to slow the outbreak have left millions of Americans out of work. Polls show the president's approval rating falling over what a majority of Americans see as his inconsistent handling of the public health and economic crises. Trump and congressional Republicans insist China should face consequences for masking the severity of the COVID-19 health crisis and spreading disinformation that the virus came from the U.S. But Trump's critics see this messaging as an attempt to shift blame away from the slow U.S. response to the pandemic, which has claimed more than 42,000 American lives. The critique of the Trump administration implies that had China been perfectly transparent, the United States would have been perfectly strategic in its response. And we know that not to be true. While accusing Biden of corrupt financial interests, critics say Trump and his family are less than transparent about their own business dealings around the world, noting the president has yet to release any tax returns. But Trump's argument that his personal wealth actually frees him from outside influence continues to resonate with many of his supporters. That's a fairly common popular strategy is to sort of say, um, you know, they're all corrupt. <laughs> I was too, but I'm, I'm going to be corrupt on your behalf, basically. The Biden campaign has countered with its own ad. It accuses Trump of ignoring early intelligence reports warning of the coronavirus threat and of praising Chinese President Xi Jinping in the midst of the crisis to preserve a recently inked trade deal between the U.S. and China. Both campaigns are increasingly critical of Beijing, reflecting growing public anger in the U.S. at China as the origin for the deadly virus that is infecting millions, causing much of the world economy to shut down. Brian Padden, VOA News, Washington. In our tech report, Nigeria-based e-commerce technology company Jumia is adapting its digital retail network to help curb the spread of COVID-19. Jumia has donated certified face masks to health ministries in Kenya, Ivory Coast, Morocco, Nigeria, and Uganda. Africa 54 technology reporter Paul Ndiho in an exclusive interview via Skype, spoke to Juliet Anama, chairwoman of Jumia Nigeria and group head of institutional affairs. She says that Jumia's primary concern is the health and well-being of its employees, consumers, partners, and communities. Joining me to discuss how COVID-19 is affecting tech companies in Africa is Juliet Anama, head of institutional affairs at a Jumia group of companies. Hello, Juliet. How are you, Paul? How are you doing? I know you've been quarantined here uh, in <laughs> Virginia. How are you able to do work uh, right here in Virginia and uh, serving people back home? Well, I guess uh, being uh, part of a digital company, uh, these are ways of working that we've, we've, we've been using for a long time. So it's, uh, it's easy for me to connect with the teams, uh, through, um, you know, video conference, audio conference, emails and, and, uh, and calls. How has uh, COVID-19 affected uh, Jumia as a tech company in Africa? One thing that this COVID-19 has made clear is that our work is, is not just a business. It's, it's a mission, actually, because it's, it's even much more relevant at a time like this when governments want people to social distance uh, they want as much as possible to move, uh, you know, more people online, more people using digital means of transactions and interactions. 
so for us, it's 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 it, it's a humbling experience to realize just how important what we've been doing has has suddenly become. Uh, you talked about uh, governments. I know uh, Jumia has been uh, working with uh, several governments uh, across uh, the continent uh, to, uh, to figure out the best way to maybe address uh, some of uh, the challenges as a result of uh, COVID-19. Uh, maybe specifically uh, bring us up to speed. What has Jumia done uh, with the different uh, governments uh, across Africa? First and foremost, um, the, the best service we can bring to the countries we work with is making sure that we protect our teammates, uh, communities, and the partners. So we, we've taken a lot of steps, practicing social distancing at work, making sure that uh, we good, keep a good track of all our employees, their policies around if someone is sick, they stay home, and and all those, you know, using making uh, contactless deliveries uh, with. Uh, uh, delivery agents and making sure that they practice those principles. Education, there's a lot of misinformation that is out there. Uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, people not getting access to the right information. So we've worked with uh, governments, places like Nigeria, South Africa, Ghana, Ivory Coast, uh, Kenya, and other markets mm. to make sure that when customers land on our landing page, that we are able to in integrate uh, the you know NC, uh, NCDC uh, information so people have access. And we've also launched in some places partnerships around uh, building the right habits for consumers. Mm -hmm. So washing of hands, for example, was launched in, in Nigeria. Every aspect of our business is relevant at this point in time. So logistics, again, very important. Uh, people are either in lockdown situations or they can't, you know, there are restrictions of movement. So being able to reach the last mile uh, is something that's very important because we are able to source uh, face certified face mask and all, all uh, you know, different types of essential items for governments. We've done that for uh, Nigeria, we've done it for Ghana, Kenya, Uganda, uh, Egypt, a couple of other countries. We've we've done the same as well. A quick follow up. You talked about uh, logistics. Uh, sometimes logistics can be a nightmare in Africa. Trying to move around to get things from one point to another. Uh, how has it been, uh, especially in light of uh, this uh, uh, crisis where most governments or most places, cities are on lockdown? Because that network existed prior to this, uh, we didn't need to start building it from scratch, and it's now extremely relevant at a, at a time like this. In uh, uh, 2014, uh, maybe two years after you had uh, launched, I met uh, uh, some of your colleagues, and uh, one of the things I told them at the time was, uh, I will not be surprised to see if uh, maybe in 10 years' time, uh, they, are, they are launching an IPO. Last year, you guys were listed on the New York uh, Stock Exchange. How has that experience been uh, being the big players on the continent? And whenever people ask me this question, I also say to them, look, uh, in addition to that is it also showed uh, opportunities that exist for other players on the continent. Mm. So it, it wasn't just a Jumia thing. It was, it, was, it was more or less showcasing Africa and what is possible in Africa. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.